Hello, I'm Chris Osman, and this is Solutions. Enough complaining, let's fix America. First thing, a uh, little housekeeping. I'd like to apologize for the poor quality of these videos, but I'm doing what I can with what I have. Uh, eventually, the production will get higher, um, uh, but there's no rush on that for now. I just want to get the information out. Uh, secondly, uh, one of the things I would like to do in this series is to not only present new topics and new solutions to some of our problems, but to also uh, go over some of the things that I've talked about in past videos, especially videos that I've uh, posted years and years ago, uh, because a lot of the things that uh, seem to be happening today could have been mitigated or avoided all entirely um, had we had uh, some of the solutions I presented back then been taken seriously or even offered out to the public. Now, one of the things I talked about yesterday was a petition that I put out. Uh, it's called In the Job Creator Lie, and it's available on sign on. I think it's .org or .com. It's one of the two. I'm, I don't remember which one, but just Google uh, in the job creator lie. And in that petition, which also contains uh, possible legislation that could be put into law, but the petition itself, it just basically talks about the, the kind of lunacy that we uh, under which we live now. And that is that we give tax breaks to the rich. Now, that would not be a problem if, if that, that money, that, that shortfall, the tax breaks that the rich should be paying, wouldn't have to come out of our pockets. But in fact, it does. So anything, any tax breaks that we provide to the rich, they then come out of our pocket to make up the budget shortfalls for our government. And uh, put it in a, I'll put it another way, um, a more simplistic way. It's very simplistic, but I, I believe this is uh, the basis of the argument for tax breaks for the rich because they keep calling them job creators. And that's a misnomer in and of itself because it's not the rich who create jobs. It's the demand for their products that create jobs. And that demand comes from consumers who demand the products or services that the rich offer. Only then will the rich create a job. So it's not out of their kindness of their hearts or anything like that and the money will trickle down if we give the rich uh, these tax breaks. It's because consumers have a demand for their product or service. So consumers drive job creation. Anyway, let's get back to uh, the rich and how they uh, uh, have been uh, portrayed in, by uh, political figures uh, over the past uh, few decades um, as being job creators. Uh, basically, like I said, if you take taxes from the, the, and give them to the rich, it comes out of our pocket. So in other words, we give our money to the rich so that the rich can in turn, hopefully, give us some money back in the form of a job after we've done some work for them. So let me restate that. Tax breaks for the rich are like us giving our money from our pockets to the rich so that the rich can possibly give us some of that money back, but only after we've done work for them. So if I give you a hundred dollars and then I ask you back or, and then you say, uh, I may let you cut my grass and I'll give you $20 back for cutting my grass. That person's kept $80. You got $20. All of that money was initially yours. And like I say, your boss doesn't work for your money. You work for your money. Your boss only gets what uh, you don't get, but they don't work for that excess that they get. Anyway, so the petition, as I said, it kind of puts an end to that ideology by asking uh, that we no longer pay the rich up front for jobs they may or may not create. And a lot of times those jobs are really bad jobs. So e even if you look at a job creator as a, a rich person as a job creator, if they're a job creator and the jobs they create are crappy jobs, are they good employees? No. You wouldn't hire somebody to do a crappy job. So why should we pay people to do crappy jobs, first off? And secondly, you don't get paid before you do, you do your work. I mean, there are some people that get deposits and things like that. But for the most part, employees don't get paid before they do their work. Whereas tax breaks for the rich imply that we should give the rich money, get them paid beforehand. And whether or not they do a good job or even do the job at all, they still get that money. So that doesn't make sense. So um, basically, go look up uh, in the job creator, Google it, 
DuckDuckGo is the new search engine with a little more privacy. Um, just look it up. It's called In the Job Creator Live. Now, let's move on to something else um, uh, that I'd like to discuss that people seem to not understand these days. And that that is money is a man-made construct. If you don't believe me, go up to any other species on the planet and ask them for change. They won't, they won't have any money in their pockets. There's no kangaroos with pouchfuls of coins so they can break a dollar for you or give you case quarters for the air machine or anything like that. Money is a man-made construct. And just like any other man-made construct, there are answers and solutions to fix these things or to negate them in the case of the dollar, which is going to happen anyway because the dollar is a fiat currency. Um, as a definition for fiat currency, I will offer this. Fiat currency is a currency that's not backed by anything. There's no hard money supporting that that uh, currency that's being printed and given to you. It's kind of like uh, um, collateral. If you buy a home and you go to a bank and you get a loan, you have to put up some collateral. And the bank has to be willing to accept that collateral um, as you know, a way of paying back your loan if you default on the loan. Uh, so the same should hold for currencies. The U.S. dollar went off the gold standard in 1971, I think, um, and it was Richard Nixon who took us off that standard. Now, once it went off the gold standard, there was nothing backing up the dollar, nothing but guns. Um, basically, our military forces other countries to take that money. And if you don't believe that, read this book called The um, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Uh, it details how America manipulates the, the sovereign leadership of sovereign nations. And it not only uh, um, tries to force them into things, it actually will kill leaders of other countries if they do not act in a manner that they feel suitable for the American empire. And yes, you do detect a bit of bias when I call it American empire because it basically operates like an empire. And all empires have a shelf life, usually two to three hundred years. And how old is America? Anyway, let's move on. So, Amer uh, money as a, a man-made construct. The reason that gold used to support the dollar was because gold is what's considered hard money because it has, there's a limited supply of it, and there's a high demand of it, and there's a, uh, it's a rare commodity. In that gold uh, is rare, because there's not a lot of it uh, that has been excavated and mined out of the earth. And it's uh, rare because it's one of the only metals, if not, yeah, it's one of the only metals, if not the only metal, that um, does not decay like other metals. It doesn't rust. So gold that existed a thousand years ago is, is still in existence today. Um, now, so that makes it a valuable commodity. And that's why gold is uh, what's considered a store of value. Because when currencies start to collapse, the gold will still be there. And people will run to the gold. That's why you're seeing gold starting to go up, um, especially in other countries. America, they kind of manipulate um, the markets. Uh, we don't really have a free market in America, as uh, some would like to suggest. Uh, because if gold was actually going up uh, according to the value um, that the rest of the world perceives it as having, uh, it would be more than five thousand, ten thousand dollars, maybe more by now. But for some reason, it's hovering around seventeen hundred dollars, and it's been around there for, uh, you know, it was only fourteen hundred dollars a, a couple years ago, and I mean it's gone up, but not uh, according to how it should have gone up. Now, money as a man-made construct. Let's get back to that. Since money is a man-made construct, since the dollar is a man-made con con construct. Um, it can be destroyed, and whether through uh, direct means or indirect means, it will eventually collapse. All fiat currencies in the past have collapsed. Anytime they have weakened, even weakened hard money, like the Romans clipping coins, anytime they've weakened hard money, that was, those were signs of uh, in the end of an empire. Uh, in America, the dollar, as I said, or maybe I haven't, maybe I didn't, but the dollar is backed by our military. 
and the military goes around. I mean, look at Libya. Uh, Gaddafi basically wanted the African, other African nations to start trading oil in gold instead of the petrodollar, which is the US dollar. It's just called the petrodollar because uh, when they use it to trade for oil. So Gaddafi wanted to uh, switch to gold as the medium uh, currency for oil. And look what happened. They went out and they got his, him overthrown and the rest is YouTube history. Um, the, uh, as far as Kadaf the end that Gaddafi met. So, why wouldn't America want to trade in gold uh, or have gold as the, the backup, uh, the, the support for the dollar? And that's basically because the gold in America is gone. You rarely even hear about Fort Knox anymore. I, I can't remember the last time I heard a story about Fort Knox. Why is that? You used to hear it used to be almost a mythical, magical place where the, all the gold in the, the country was stored. But you never hear stories about Fort Knox anymore. Um, anyway, so the, as um, what will happen with the dollar and uh, we'll go into the reasons why is eventually other nations are going to stop trading in the dollar. It will not be what's called the world's reserve currency, which means basically that everybody is trading in that currency. Which means that if you control that currency, you actually um, can print as much as you want and tell everybody whatever the value is and you can manipulate the, 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 the currency any way you see fit, which is what the Federal Reserve does. Side note, the Federal Reserve is not a federal uh, government agency. It's a, it's a series of privately owned banks that they just call Federal Reserve. And uh, it's owned by private citizens. It's not owned by the government. And it is the entity that prints up all the dollars. And the worst part about it is that it prints up all the dollars with 40 cents on every dollar being in debt. So our government goes into debt 40 cents on every dollar for every dollar that the Federal Reserve prints. There's a problem with that. Because if you continue to print debt, then you have to continue to print the currency. So if the US dollar, the US government continues to go into debt at the tune of 40 cents on every dollar, then they have to keep accepting more and more money to cover that debt or the interest on that debt, which is becoming outrageously stupid. America owes over $23 trillion now. How is that more than an abstract constraint? an abstraction to the 44% of Americans who were only making $18,000 a year before COVID-19 even hit. There's no way you can comprehend tri trillions of dollars. It has to look like monopoly money to those people. It looks like monopoly money to me. Um, and so what happens when you continue to print as the Federal Reserve has done, which that's another story. There are so many things that, that I would love to go off on. And I'm sorry for all these tangents, but I try to get back to to the top. I will try to get back to the topic of the day, which is money as a construct. So the Federal Reserve prints uh, uh, a dollar. Forty cents of that dollar is debt. So we have to keep continuing to print. But what happens when you print trillions of dollars and add it to the existing supply of money is that every dollar in that existing supply gets watered down. So let me simplify it. There's 100 people. You have one person who prints up the money. He prints up $100 and gives a dollar to each person. Then he decides to print up another $100. But instead of giving it to every person, he keeps that $100 for himself. So now the currency is thinned out to the point that every dollar is now worth half as much. But this one person has $101, while everybody else has $1, which is now worth half as much. So in essence, everybody else's dollar is now worth 50 cents in value. But this guy has 101 of those dollars. So even if his money is divided in half, it's worth 50, a little bit over uh, 50 cents. He's got 101 of those. So he has the money to buy everything that he needs while everybody else is, is basically getting more and more impoverished. So 
there you have uh, the issue with the the uh, um, Federal Reserve as they continue to print up these trillions of dollars that are only going to the people that they want it to go to banks corporations and the wealthy that means that the dollars in everybody else's pocket is getting thinned out more and more day by day so the value of every dollar that's in your pocket that's in your bank account is becoming worth less and less and the rest of the world they see this as well they understand that the Federal Reserve is basically printing monopoly money. They're printing money to where the point to the point where it's going to be worth less and less. I mean, consider this: we've had four stimuluses now, and trillions of dollars have gone out the door. But it's only gone to certain people. It hasn't gone to the majority of the people in this country. So, what it does as it goes out the door to the rich is that it thins out everybody's dollar. But it's not going back into the economy. Because the rich don't need to spend it. All they need to do is put it in some bank account, put it in their pocket, put it in their mattress, wherever, they, wherever they're going to hoard it, that's where that money will go. And in the end, it does serve to water down every dollar in your pocket. So at some point, when the money is watered down so thin for the majority of people, people will just not use that money. It becomes useless. How could it be worth something if you have a dollar that is not only worth a penny, in your pocket because they printed up so much money and they're printing continually they're just continuing to print this money that is basically harming the entire nation not just you know there's no way that they can justify that this money will help the country because it's not helping anybody except for those who are getting it and it's not even going to help them in the end because once people turn away from the dollar we'll have to figure out another currency and think about this. Before the dollar, the British pound was the uh, currency of reserve. After World War II, the dollar uh, became the currency reserve because uh, uh, the, the, the Britain had so much debt. So they lost their standing as the country holding the currency of reserve. Now, America is the country of reserve. And all we've done is mistreat other countries for decades now. And there are countries out there like China and Russia and other countries that are constantly considering ways to get away from the American dollar. And one of the, the, the things is like the petrodollar. That's all falling apart because look at oil. Oil was, I think it was trading in net, the negative. Basically, people who were had oil contracts were paying to get rid of the oil because those contracts were coming due. And nobody wants a, a investment that's going down. Nobody wants that. So unless you're shorting the market. But for the most part, if you buy something, a commodity, commodity your hope is that it's going to go up in price. Anyway, so oil is falling apart. So the petrodollar is going to fall apart. The U.S. dollar is going to fall apart. And um, as I said, money is a man-made man -made construct. So there is a solution to money is a man-made construct. One of the things is that, uh, well, actually it's too late because uh, gold, it's, you're hard-pressed to find physical gold anymore. But one of the other things, and it may not be um, the final solution, but it is an answer to what's going on right now, and that's Bitcoin. Bitcoin's value goes up. It's scarce. There's only going to be so many Bitcoin ever printed. So there's not going to be an added supply. That's why all these countries are trying to fight it. Um, but as you, if you look at the price of Bitcoin, yeah, it does fluctuate. But it, it does offer a means for you, your money, to not get watered down by um, uh, uh, excessive printing by the Federal Reserve. Now... I will go further into the Federal Reserve and the alternatives to the Federal Reserve um, that, that have existed in the past and that possibly could exist in the future. But right now, let me just say this. If you have an entity, a private entity, that is, that is bigger than your government because it's printing all the money that your government relies on, there's a problem with your system. Because your government is no longer um, beholden to its citizens. It's beholden to the people who control the money. And that's what we have in America right now. Well, 
thanks for joining me for this uh, episode of uh, Solutions Enough Complaining, Let's Fix America. I hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you.